Om. Welcome everyone. And we'll begin with the non-dual invocation. Atma Twangiri Jamati Sahachara Prana Shari Rangerham Puja Te Vishayo Pabhogarachana Nidra Samadhistiti Sanchara Padayo Pradakshina Vidhi Stotrani Sarva Gira Yadiyat Karma Karomita Dakilam Shambho Tavaradhanam Jaya Jaya Karunabde Shri Mahadeva Shambho Jaya Jaya Karunabde Shri Mahadeva Shambho How wonderful to be here with all of you, all of you online and in person, 140 of you online. And yeah, here as um, the days of summer start to wane, right? There's a, there's a thing that happens in September, not for everyone, but for a lot of people where you feel that urge to deepen your studies, you know, back to school time, <laughs> whether or not you have kids, there's that, just that impulse as the days start to get shorter, as the air turns a little crisper, right? And it gives that clarity to the mind. It's like, oh, I want to deepen my studies in these beautiful traditions like non-dual Shaiva Tantra and yoga philosophy. So therefore, I'm extremely excited to make this special announcement. Now, this is quasi-secret. This is on the down low for all of this is for all of you guys, but don't go telling all your friends yet, okay? At least for a few more days. So those of you who are on this live call get to hear the announcement that even if as we speak, or mere minutes ago, we have launched the beta version of Tantrika 2.0. That's my Kermit impression. Do you remember him on the Muppet Show? Yay! <laughs> um, yeah. So this is more wonderful than uh, most of you even realize. Uh, the amount of work that's gone into this to a complete overhaul of our of our um, online learning portal, right? Tantrika Online, we often just call it, with more material, more content, but also much better organized, more streamlined, more functional, more bug free, more beautiful, more everything, basically. Um, so it's really a big step closer to our dream, which is to have the most comprehensive online learning portal in tantric philosophy and tantric yoga uh, for practitioners in the world, mm -hmm. um, and certainly in the English speaking language. Uh, so, and we'll have, we'll diversify into, into more languages ultimately as well. So yeah, Tantrika 2.0, uh, I just like to um, thank some of those who made it possible. There isn't time to thank everyone, uh, but for sure, some praises are needed for Mr. Stuart Williams. Yay! <laughs> um, 
Stuart has been absolutely incredible and uh, working long, long, long hours as a labor of love, you know, just totally doing what, what wouldn't be done unless there was a lot of love behind it. And uh, also with applying his brilliance, um, working with our, our um, software developer, Andreas, who I think is not on the call, but he's a brilliant um, um, software developer. Um, and he uh, took over from, from, from the previous team at, at, and really took it that next big step forward. Um, and Florentine as well has been working very, very hard and with a lot of love, right? All, all these people for months, but the last few weeks and the last few days, you know, down to the, down to the wire. Um, Kat, our new managing director, has also been putting all her love and brilliance and heart and um, long hours into it. Um, and then we've had a bunch of volunteers, um, but is regarding the, the new online learning portal, the 2.0, one of our keynote volunteers, if that's the right word, key volunteers, <laughs> is uh, someone who many of you know, Nora, who really, really just uh, was absolutely brilliant and um, instrumental a a a among the volunteers, especially. So, and then there are, there are other volunteers and other folks, but uh, this is just an amazing dream team. Um, and the others will forgive me for not mentioning them this time, we'll mention you on another call, we got to keep this short, but these uh, these are our wonderful key players. Thank you so much for all your incredible effort uh, and and the care. It's really about the care and the love that that makes it possible. Yes, yeah, sadhu, sadhu. That means like bravo in Sanskrit. Um, okay, so before we move on to our satsang, I'm gonna hand it over to. Stuart to um, just give us a little preview, uh, a little preview of the new site. And again, this is uh, just to be super clear for everyone, you, you 150 people can go to the site, you can log in, you can log in and you can explore and uh, we want you to. And if you notice any issues, we want you to tell us this is the beta launch. So you're all you're invited to go and, and explore the new site. Just don't tell all your friends because this is the beta launch. <laughs> so we want to we we want to fix any little problems if there are any. We've been looking for them, but uh, you might find something we didn't find. Um, and then we'll have the official launch and tell you know our fifteen thousand person community about it. So it's just for you guys right now. Um, Stuart, take it away. Well, <clears throat> I can show you the new website at the moment, but um, uh, Arisha, I sent you a text a little moment ago. Okay. The, the transfer of the actual learning portal is being held up in, with the DNS change. So it's not, you won't actually be able to see it right now. It's, it's not visible to anyone. So if you are going to be um, in Europe, uh, we, we can encourage you to to log in tomorrow morning. Same same URL, same way to access it as you have in the past. Uh, if you're in the Americas, um, you could possibly get in there this evening, depending on how quickly it gets released. I could quickly um, screen share the, the new website, um, which you can see. It should have released from most of the DNS, uh, through the DNS on most uh, locations around the world. So um, depending where you are, you should be able to see this live at tantraginstitute.org. Um, this, in this video, we've got someone on the call in this video, I believe, Carl's on the call, probably. Um, <clears throat> just a simple new site that hopefully will be easier to get what you need. We have released a new course called The Basics of Tantric Yoga, which is free. Um, 
you've got Tantric Online, Tantric in person. And we'll have one thing we're going to be doing is we're going to be selling courses separately. Not all courses, obviously, but certainly if you're a Kula member um, and you'd prefer to purchase one course and not an entire membership, you, you'll be able to do that. And we'll be launching a couple of these. Some of our wonderful testimonials that people volunteered to us in our survey, they're scattered throughout the site. But yeah, the membership, I'm, um, we'll be sending out some information about that, about how the new membership structure is gonna be working. And so I don't wanna dive into that right now because that's um, a tangent, but there is a new membership structure, which once you get on the site, you can go and take a look at it. And there'll be more information coming early next week to give you some clarity around that. So don't, uh, yeah, don't panic around that. We'll, we'll walk you through that process. Um, yeah, but this is the new site. Unfortunately, let's just take a quick look. I don't think, I mean, even if it is up, we're going to have some glitches to iron out. So if you do log on later on this afternoon and it's there, please give us um, <clears throat> give us some time to just fix whatever gets broken as we move the move the site over from the staging servers onto the actual live site. But yeah, unfortunately, that's all I got to show you at the moment. But hopefully, um, certainly, if you're in, if you're in Europe, you'll wake up tomorrow morning and you and you should be able to see it. Wonderful. Thank you, Stuart. Um, so yeah, just to be clear, then, uh, I didn't get the memo right before the call <laughs> that that we aren't actually quite live yet. But it is imminent within hours, right? So you get to experience sweet anticipation. <laughs> Um, yes, so coming in in some hours and please check it out tomorrow. And uh, Stuart, am I right in thinking that when it does appear, their same login will work? Their it same should. password. It, it should. Certainly, uh, that's the hope. <laughs> but yeah, we've <laughs> done a lot of effort in, in making sure that that there really shouldn't be much of a change for you. So when you go to log in, you should be able to do that, no problem. And hopefully as well, the progress you've made on your on your courses will be retained as well. Um, there are some, there there is some new content in there. There's a whole bunch of Patreon content, which wasn't there before. There's a new Tantra Sara webinar series from Patreon, which will be good, I'm sure, for many of you to go and see. And there's um, a couple new um, courses available to Kula members as well. Um, so you'll be able to access the six simple steps webinar series, as well as the seven facets overview series. So if you're a cool member, you can go and take a look at those. Um, but yeah. Thank you. We're, we're at this stage if we're looking for significant errors, <laughs> yeah. which we hope there will be none. Yeah, but not right now. We're not asking for that now. We're asking for that starting tomorrow, right? Correct. Yeah. Whoa, okay. <laughs> um, okay, so just answering some quick questions, some quick practical questions about the new site. For example, Anish asks, uh, is Foundations course being discontinued? No, no courses are discontinued. They're all, they'll all be there, some in new forms, plus more material. So material that used to be housed only on Patreon is on the new site. We haven't completed that process quite, but in fact, all material, wherever it lives on the internet, will all be here and more and more will exclusively be here. So it can be your one-stop shop. And of course, we'll be adding um, uh, other teachers as well in, in due course. So in fact, you, you won't be losing anything. You'll only be gaining, okay? So, I'm just yeah, saying. and to, just to reiterate on that, that all of the Patreon content, and that's how wonderful Nora is, all the Patreon content is on the new portal, but it's not all yet released. We will be bringing it in uh, weekly, monthly, but certainly the Tantra Sara is there. 
Um, and there's all of the Ask Me Anything sessions are already in the portal. So there's a bunch of, of great Patreon stuff that you can get into. A couple of new meditations, guided meditations. Um, but yeah, lots of lots of fresh content that, that hasn't been available to our Tantrika subscribers. That's yeah. perhaps something of significance just to announce that the Samayin and Tantrika levels are no longer going to exist. Uh, we'll just have two subscription uh, membership levels. We have um, Kula will remain as the, the the entry membership level, and then we'll have Sadaka as up as our premium membership level. Yeah, yeah. So you'll get more info about all of that. Um, there will continue to be free offerings. And uh, but you'll get more information about the two main tiers and what's included and so on. And yeah, please know that our our Tantrika Institute team is now, you know, something like a, a dozen full time people. So, uh, yes, to be a subscriber costs a little bit of money, but it's absolutely worth it, you know. And by the way, there, there's I, one big big yeah. thing that we're leaving out of this in terms of increasing content Harish, which is that we will be holding live asana uh, and or embodiment classes five days a week so you will be able to do um, an embodied practice live on the portal with our delightful cat whitney um and and for our cooler members, you will have access to a recording once a week of one of those classes. So you'll also get um, some asana, asana or embodiment practice. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, of course, as you all know, tantric yoga is an embodied tradition, right? It's a tradition that stresses embodiment, uh, especially in its in its kaula variant, which we stress in this in this particular community, um, or focus on. And so, you know, it only makes sense to actually offer uh, classes that that cultivate um, the physical body and the holistic interconnection of the physical body with all the other layers of the self. So we'll have, uh, we hope, um, you know, several, several uh, teachers offering and both live and, and recording. So that's, there's more information about that coming too. But anyway, you can be, it's, it, we're becoming more of what we always wanted, which is a community which you can touch into almost every day for something new or something live, um, and and that's that's just flourishing and growing all the time. And just just one yeah one more thing, which is that when you do get to see the portal once it pops up, and that's studentportal.tantricainstitute.org, um, we have this entire forum. So that desire to slowly those who who have resistance to being on Facebook. Um, can absolutely be engaged socially with the cooler with the community on our site. So away from any sort of large corporate entity. And one thing I do encourage you just when you do get over to that form is please make sure that you read through the guidelines before you start posting. Make sure you're posting in the right place. If you have any questions, you can just send an email. Don't have to rush into it and and just <clears throat> spoil the process. Just take your time with it, read it, and find where you want to appropriately post. Yeah, yeah, that's another huge part of it that we that we almost forgot to mention is w once our community forums are all up and running, there will be no reason to be on Facebook anymore. We will not, you know, delete that whole wonderful Facebook group with a lot of history in it. Um, but we will eventually start archiving it and will eventually close it down, just not too soon, because I know that would make a lot of you panic because <laughs> uh, it's been a key resource for you. Um, but just know that as we have our community forums up and running and, 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 and everyone gets used to them, uh, we don't need to be uh, on Facebook anymore. And for those of you who you know aren't aware of um, the reasons why, you know, watch the social dilemma. Is that the name of it? 
Uh, yeah, <laughs> which is actually just a very superficial introduction to the issues, but that are much covered in much more detail elsewhere. But um, yeah, we don't want to have all our data constantly scraped by a corporate entity that has no moral or spiritual connection to us whatsoever. So we do want to have our own home on the internet. And, and now we do, and we'll keep growing it until it has all the functionality that you would want from your social media platforms. And there's no, no reason to be there anymore. Um, yeah. Cool. Okay. I think we're, we're done with that part now. Thank you, Stuart. Amazing job. Yeah. Okay. So we'll move into our Q and A satsang section. Uh, I also just want to give you a little update on. Um, you know, various various translations that I've been working on, which I realized not not everyone knows about because a lot of these are already available in some form or another. And um, uh, Florentine can provide you with links um, here for the things I mentioned. So as you know, um, the first translation to come out in book form is the Recognition Sutras, right? A complete translation and explanation of the Pratyavigna Hridaya of Rajanaka Kshemaraja. And there's a lot more coming and, and, and a number of translations that are already done, but I just am still writing the commentary, right? So one, for example, is the Spandakarika, the beautiful stanzas on pulsation written by Kalata in the ninth, uh, eighth or ninth century, together with his commentary on his own stanzas, just like Shemaraja wrote a commentary on his own sutras, the recognition sutras. Kalata wrote a commentary on his own stanzas, his own verses on, on uh, the principle of oscillation or pulsation as a fundamental quality of consciousness. And this, of course, is what defines well, it's one of the key things that define the tantric tradition over and against other Asian spiritual traditions um, in the pre-modern period is that they argue that consciousness is inherently dynamic, right? Whereas the Vedantins and others, the, the Patanjalas and others as well, argued that consciousness is static. It's absolutely still. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't go anywhere. It's just a static, passive witness. Um, well, Tantra uh, argued quite the opposite. Consciousness is inherently dynamic, and it contracts into the form of the substance of any experience whatsoever and releases that and uh, uh, expands back into its infinite potential once again. Um, and how it does that on many different scales, including the scale of a whole lifetime and the scale of a single day and the scale of moment to moment to moment is all uh, taught in the Spandakarikas. And um, so that translation is already done and uh, just the explanation still needs to be written. And uh, Florence, Quarantine links you to my recitation of the translation, just the verses there, not the author's commentary on his own verses, just the verses for poetic savoring, okay? But there's also blog posts that give you the translation with the explanation uh, as well, okay? So then Kshemiraja, who wrote um, the Recognition Sutras, also wrote a commentary on the same Spandakarika, the stanzas on pulsation. And so that, uh, I've been working on that as well. That's not available yet. Um, okay. So then I've um, translated the Tantra Sara of Abhinavagupta, the essence of Tantra, right? By the guru of Kshemiraja, Abhinavagupta, 
right? Many of you already know these names intimately well. Others who are new to the, to the tradition might be already hopelessly lost. Don't worry, it's fine. I'm just making sure that those who are ready to, you know, uh, read any of this stuff but didn't know it's there is, um, and so it's, 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 it's available. So the Tantra Sada, uh, I haven't done, I haven't done the entire thing. I've done uh, these chapters and I'll also add chapter 22, um, which will be very interesting. I can't give that away yet. But chapters one through five and 11 are already published on the blog posts and uh, Florentine has already given you that link. So that's again, the essence of Tantra by the great master Abhinavagupta writing just over a thousand years ago. And then I'm working on um, Tantra Loka chapter one, right? Which is uh, Abhinavagupta's masterwork. And chapter one contains all the teachings of the entire vast work, the Tantra Loka, which means light on Tantra. Um, chapter one, again, contains the teachings of all the vast work in concise microcosmic form. That's one of the principles of the tradition, right? The macrocosm is reflected in the microcosm. So the whole Tantra Loka is right there in chapter one, uh, and it's expounded in greater detail later on. But I will be releasing this translation um, fairly soon. And then also working on other chapters like four and five together with my colleague, Ben Williams. And those chapters are key because they detail ancient tantric yoga practices, many of which have been forgotten um, over the centuries. Uh, not entirely, but certainly uh, are not part of the mainstream of, of the yoga traditions. Okay. So there's a bunch of blog posts already up with the Tantra Loka translation. And these teachings, Abhinavagupta's teachings on, on uh, the essence of Tantra and light on Tantra from these two texts will be given in some detail at the, at the uh, retreat in exactly one month from now. Um, so it's the, the teachings of Abhinavagupta retreat called the essence of Tantra or Tantra Sada retreat, where we'll go into the first five chapters in detail. And also you'll learn the five key practices, um, four or five key practices that are taught in the essence of Tantra. Okay, then what else? Um, right, so then uh, my translation of the Vigyana Bhairava is already complete, right? This primary source text, um, the scripture called the Vigyana Bhairava Tantra, right? Popularly known in the New Age world as the Radiance Sutras um, and known amongst followers of Osho as the Book of Secrets. Um, known amongst Zen practitioners from the translation in the book Zen Bones, Zen Flesh, or Zen Flesh, Zen Bones by Paul Reps. So this text has been out there circulating in various forms for a long time. But fascinatingly, there is not a single published uh, translation by um, a Sanskrit scholar who has specialized in the tradition from which the text comes. So that will be my forthcoming translation. So meaning to say, um, even people who can read Sanskrit often don't know what's going on in this text because it's alluding to and referencing a whole bunch of other sources that the text expects you to know to interpret its verses. So that's why only a scholar of, of Tantra uh, could actually translate it accurately. So that is being worked on as well. The translation is already complete. Um, I don't have the complete translation posted yet, but we will. Um, we'll put it up on the new on the new site. Um, and then there's also a uh, 
companion text, almost a sequel to the VVT called The Blossoming of Innate Awareness. That is already translated completely and um, published on, on the blog site and in commentary videos as well. Um, the, the VBT, the Vigyana Bhairava Tantra course is also on the new site. I don't know if the Blossoming of Innate Awareness course is on the new site yet, but if it's not, it will be imminently. Um, okay. So I'm, I'm just moving quickly again, because man, many of you are already familiar with these titles and those of you who are not, um, a lot of Sanskrit words gets very confusing very quickly, but <laughs> you can be excited that this is a renaissance, you guys. It's not just my work, the work of many other scholars, um, especially many young tantric scholars, well, youngish, <laughs> you know, in their in their 40s, um, some in their 30s. Uh, they are working diligently to, to translate this tradition. Let's remember over 90% of its sources are still untranslated um, into a, a Western language. So this is happening now. This is the Renaissance in Tantric studies and it's really exciting and, and new work is coming out all the time. So you get to, uh, to be amongst the first readers um, of these new translations. Um, so that's, that's quite wonderful. Okay. Uh, what else do I want to mention? The last thing I'll mention for now, there are other projects, but the last thing I'll mention for now is um, the Chuma Sanketa Prakasha, the, the secret oral teachings of the tantric yoginis, also never before translated, never, never published in any Western language. Um, that is uh, on the new site as well. Not the complete translation yet. Uh, I think it's about a, a third of it at this point. Um, which reminds me, I need to get the, the PDF to my, to my team. <laughs> so this will all, all of these will be books. Sally says, will VBT translation be a book? Yes, all of the material I'm talking about will, will come out in book form. Um, and many of these texts, if not all of these texts, were originally meant to be something like teacher's manuals. Actually not, the, the, the re, you know, if they seem inaccessible to new students of the tradition, that's because they are. <laughs> Meaning to say, there, with some rare exceptions, like um, the Recognition Sutras is a kind of primer or introduction to the tradition, uh, but other than that, most of the texts we're talking about are really sort of teacher's manuals um, that you mine uh, to, to, to share with others traditionally. That doesn't mean you need to be a teacher to read them, far from it. I'm just saying um, that's part of why they read as they do. Uh, they, didn't, they, they weren't um, written in the way that we write books now. Nowadays, people write books always with an eye on the possibility of making the New York Times bestseller list. And if you have an eye on that possibility, you're trying to write in simple way and reach a broader audience and stuff. And these past masters, were not, they were not like that. They were not trying to reach the broadest, broadest audience. They were trying to articulate the truth of existence in as accurate a way as possible, right? And that is a subtle, subtle, uh, and challenging and beautiful endeavor. And so they used poetry, they used abstruse language, they used philosophical language, they used experiential language. Um, but what they didn't try to do was reach the broadest possible audience. So that's my, my, my challenge, not that I'm interested in reaching the broadest possible audience, but to make it more accessible. And the example is in the Recognition Sutras book, um, that was, you know, for some people that's still too dense, but that is really about as accessible as it can, as I can possibly make the material without, of course, watering it down to the point of losing the, the power of the teachings, right? If you water them down too much, they actually just don't come across. They don't land in the heart of the practitioner. Yeah. Um, okay. So a little, a, a little bringing everyone up to date. 
Um, and now we can open it to questions about any of that, but also about anything in the spiritual life. Um, in terms of, you know, for, for anyone who doesn't know, and we do have new people joining the community all the time, um, you know, Tantric Shaivism, also known as Shaiva Tantra, is my specialty, but I did train as a um, scholar of religion and classics, doing comparative religion, studying Sufism, studying uh, some, some Kabbalah, studying um, Christian mysticism, Gnosticism, uh, all kinds of stuff. Not that I'm an expert in any of those areas. Those, these are all very deep fields. Um, but, uh, you know, the, something I've been fascinated with for many, many decades is, is just the whole human enterprise of meaning making that's called religion and searching for truth beyond the conceptual mind, which is called spirituality. So as a, as a scholar of that whole field, I love to just, you know, welcome questions on, on anything to do with the spiritual life, not to suggest I can answer all of them, um, but I like to throw the door wide open to whatever is um, alive in you. And the only request I would make is that your questions aren't only alive in the intellect, but are also alive in your heart uh, and in your body, you know, that it's um, the concern is more than simply intellectual um, that drives your question. That's my, my only request because having, having foregone the academic career path uh, I'm, I'm not as passionately interested in the purely intellectual questions these days. So you can raise your hand when you're ready. Someone wrote me a private message saying, um, excited about your upcoming books. I've just started listening to Tantra Illuminated for the fifth time and plan to continue to 10 times at least <laughs> and then alternate with recognition sutras till your other books are available. <laughs> um, and this might sound crazy to some of you, but in fact, uh, so many people have told me that these audiobooks or print books repay repeated listening and repeated reading and that people still get more out of them on the 10th iteration so if you know if that's not a good recommendation i don't know what is um i couldn't have written them myself <laughs> meaning to say if there wasn't a, a kind of mandate <laughs> from from life energy or higher power or goddess um then then they would not have have been uh, completed something magical happened with those two books and hopefully will happen again um okay just looking at your comments really quick Eric says, could you mention something about the historical connection between Tantra and shamanism? If I remember correctly, you've indicated before that such a connection exists. Absolutely. Uh, it depends what you mean by shamanism, right? That, that term originally uh, comes out of Mongolia, um, but is used to, apl uh, to apply to similar kinds of um, practices passed down from non- <laughs> Please be careful about muting yourself, everyone. Um, passed down, so shamanic traditions are those that are passed down through orally um, in, in often sort of tr what we might call tribal or indigenous con uh, contexts and that often involve things like beneficial spirit possession um, and uh, shamanic journeying 
And for the most part, traditional shamanism has very little in common with neo shamanism, which is a feature of the of the new age community, not putting it down, just saying it doesn't have that much in common with traditional shamanism, which did inform um, certain aspects of the tantric tradition that are not too much in view when it comes to classical tantra, they are there in the background. But things like um, experiencing beneficial possession or altered states of consciousness that give you access to um, otherworldly insights, for lack of a better term, these are very much a part of the tantric tradition. But the authors of the of the classical texts did tend to background them to almost almost uh, not not quite hide them, but to, but background them because, well. Tantra as a spiritual path became respected in, in court, right? Meaning to say kings and, and, and ministers started patronizing um, uh, and supporting the tantric tradition. And some of the earlier kind of wild and weird blood rituals, sexual rituals, possession rituals um, that came much earlier in the tradition get sort of backgrounded as the kind of embarrassing eccentric relative or whatever um, uh, of this more more courtly Tantra, the sophisticated, philosophically sophisticated courtly Tantra that nevertheless maintained its connection to these, to this shamanic, quasi-shamanic background, okay? Um, but it didn't do so, you know, very much in public view. So, Who's written about that? Sanderson, Alexa Sanderson has written about that um, in one of his very first articles, like uh, Power and Purity Among the Brahmins of Kashmir, which is an amazing uh, article. But that's all I'm going to say about it for right now, because we've got a lot of questions. Um, <clears throat> And I'll come to those of you who, who've raised your hands. Well, maybe if I alternate between questions in the chat window and those of you who, who've raised your hands. So, um, Alice, hello. Hi. Hi. By the way, um, note, I'm Italian, so it's Alice. Oh, Alice. Wonderful. Hi. Um, I have a question about practice. Um, there are a couple of practices that I do every day. And sometimes I wonder whether there's, it comes a time when a practice is, has exhausted its course. And I wonder if there are signs to recognize that. And then how do you move on to like, okay, I'm gonna choose another practice. How, how does that work? Yeah, great question, actually, because in some traditions, they tell you to just kind of plug away, just keep doing that same practice, you know, um, so called transcendental meditation is one example where they give you a mantra and they say just meditate on this 20 minutes, twice a day, forever. Um, and maybe something will happen. Okay, I'm sounding a little critical there. But <laughs> Tantra is a tradition that supplies us with a vast panoply of practices and people get overwhelmed because, oh, there's too many practices, but you're not supposed to do them all. You know, you're, you, you, you get to explore and experiment, right? Your sadhana, your spiritual practice is your experimental laboratory. And part of the reason we have so many practices is because in this tradition, we say, if it's not fresh, drop it and come back to it later let it refresh, just like the earth, you know, the fields uh, where crops grow, you have to let them lie fallow for a season or a year even, right? They replenish themselves by not uh, growing crops for a little while. And in the same way, if you let a practice go that's no longer fresh and come back to it later, it can be often refreshed, right? So practice has got to be, uh, in this tradition, uh, 
juicy in some way. Now, juicy doesn't mean that you like it necessarily, or that you like it all the time, but that there's something you're working with. So maybe the practice is resonant because it's blissful, but maybe it's resonant because it's challenging, because it's really challenging you, but you know something in you says, this is it, this is it, keep going with this, this is good challenge, you know? But either way, it's not boring, <laughs> you know? It's not just dull. So you get to experiment. Vigyana Bhairava Tantra alone has 112 practices uh, on all three levels of, of practice that we might call body, including energy body, mind, and spirit. And so you can experiment and, make, and, and always find something that's, that's really um, fresh and interesting to experiment with. Of course, you can go too far the other way. You can be like, you know, just nibbling at this huge buffet table and never get enough nutrition because you're just nibbling on this yummy thing and nibbling on that one. So you do need to think about, you know, going deep with a handful of practices as well, um, but finding those uh, uh, through experimentation. So absolutely, um, two things about practice, you know, it. Let it, let it be fresh, let it be exciting. Uh, doesn't need to be dull. Uh, but the other thing is um, when practice is really working, when your practice life is, is alive and well, you are seeing noticeable, substantial, undoubtable effects from your practices in a time scale of weeks to months, not years. So life's too short for this. Years and years of practice, maybe something will happen. You know, um, if you're not seeing results in the scale of weeks to months, um, then you you got to look at something hard. You're you you're not you don't have the access to the right practices, or maybe you're, you know, maybe you need a different teacher. Who knows what it is? But you but it this it it really works in le in, in less time than that. It can. Uh, did that answer your question or? Yeah, I think, I think so. Um, I think that the thing that I find a little daunting at times is like, okay, uh, which one do I choose if I, you know, there are some that I feel work for me and I, and sometimes I'm like, um, I would like to maybe try something else to not be stale and explore, um, what else can be experienced, can be learned. And I just don't know what to choose or if it's just like, okay, next, <laughs> whatever is on the list. Yeah, I would say um, a great strategy is to have your, your, your a handful of go-to practices that you, that you already love or that you know uh, you're getting somewhere with them. And you, and you keep doing those regularly, maybe every day, maybe several times a week, but then you're also doing experiments. So uh, in the ideal world, you have two practice sessions a day, you know, and maybe you have your regular practice and then your experimental practice time, you know, maybe uh, for several nights a week, that's what you do instead of watch Netflix or whatever, you know, um, because it can be a wonderful evening entertainment to explore <laughs> some new practices, um, maybe with a friend or, or even just on your own. So, yeah, I would say both. It's a two pronged approach. You keep experimenting and and seeing letting the kind, following the kind of golden thread of your of your intuition, but also going deep with um, a handful of things that work for you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Alice. Okay, in the chat window, Renee says, um, how can the spiritual view of Shaiva Tantra help us interact with the various opinions, personalities, fears, and facts in the news about this pandemic? Well, you, 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 in a sense, you didn't need to add about this pandemic <laughs> because the teachings of Shaiva Tantra equip you from, for all life situations. There are no special teachings for circumstances like that. Do you know what I mean? Because, because the teachings are universal, 
right? So this is a question I get asked a lot, and I know other teachers get asked a lot too. People go to uh, teachers, spiritual teachers, and say, what, what does your tradition have to say about how to deal with something like a global pandemic? And we're like, the same thing that it says about everything. <laughs> you know, if you apply the teachings to your life rigorously, you will experience a radical reconfiguration of how you relate to everything and the arrival of a new scenario like a global pandemic doesn't make a difference to that if it does then to be honest that's a sign that you haven't internalized the teachings very deeply if you're thrown for a loop by a new situation because there are no new situations it's just endless reconfigurations of the same fundamental parameters of embodied consciousness, okay? So that's, that's rather important actually. And, but how, do the spirit, how does the spiritual view of Shaiva Tantra help us interact with um, various opinions, personalities, fears, and facts? It feels like behind this question, there's a question of, um, how do I resolve all these apparently contradictory inputs? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to answer this question with the spiritual teacher hat on rather than some other hat like political social activist or whatever else I've sort of dabbled in at various moments. Because the spiritual answer is, is, is the one being asked for, and I think it's actually the deepest one, which is, um, to thine own self be true. And what that means in this context is um, really strengthening your ability to listen deeply to your own intuition, regardless of what anyone else says about it. You know, so for example, um, maybe you know that it's just not good for you. It's not good for your psyche and your body mind to be listening to the news all the time. And other people say, oh, but you have to be informed. Well, that's their story. Or maybe it's true for you. I don't know. But it, it, you have to check whether it's true for you. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? We uh, have a kind of compulsive problem being social creatures we compulsively take on other people's stories as if we should believe them as and even sometimes as, as if our survival depends on believing other people's stories because that's how our brains were originally programmed um 70 000, years ago right in our original tribal context but that is not our current context we have to be willing to do the work to shed the the atavisms of our evolutionary history, right? And atavism being something that evolved to be adaptive at one time that's no longer adaptive. Um, so you don't have to resolve all these contradictory opinions and social media and news sources, so-called news sources. Are there any news sources left? I don't know. Um, but, be, but because everything's profit driven. But if you, um, there are actually some news sources that are not profit driven, like Politico. If you're, if you're, you know, you should find out about them. I don't need to recommend. Look, at, look up things. Find out about sources that are not profit driven. If you want to know about news at all, but who says you have to? You know, um, what if you make your own internal compass your unerring. Uh, source, you know, not to say don't listen to what others have to say, of course, like we're social beings, again, we have to um, listen, but then again and again, come back to your own center, your own midline, your own central channel, and feel what's true for you. And I totally realize that in giving this advice, that some of you will decide on things that I personally disagree with very strongly. But that's exactly how it should be. You know, that's that to me is that's part of integrity is I need to give you advice that will lead some of you to, <laughs> to choices that I might disagree with. But we 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 need to um, on the spiritual path to find our our own internal compass and trust it. Um, as, as the great poet Walt Whitman said, listen to all sides and filter them from yourself.
you filter them through and from, you know, so then you come back to yourself, having listened to all sides, and you trust that inner knowing. Um, so, and this doesn't mean, ha I'm not talking about deciding about whose opinion is right. Nobody's opinion is right. They're just, their opinions, you know. Of course, there are such things as facts. Um, not all, <laughs> this is a problem in our current cultural discourses. Some people's attempt to report facts gets labeled as opinion. Uh, and, and that's understandable because reporting facts is increasingly difficult, but it, that doesn't make it impossible, right? Um, okay, I could go on and on about that, but I won't. Instead, I'll, <laughs> I'll take Janaki's question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, it feels a bit difficult to ask, but I wanted to. Um, I am, um, I'm going to be having a, um, a hysterectomy in a couple of, in a few months. Um, and it feels really terrifying. And um, one of the things that I started to wonder about or um, is how does having like your physical organs removed affect sort of the energy flow in your body? Because it feels like I feel this great sense of loss, like something's going to be taken away. And um, yeah, I, I'm just curious. It It's kind of been bothering me about what that might, having like my entire reproductive system taken out of my body due to um, how, it, how the energy is, yeah. Great question and brave. Thank you. So here's the good news. <laughs> um, the energy body is in this tradition said to be more fundamental and more real than the physical body. And people have to verify this in their direct experience, of course. But even when this physical body dies, drops away, the energy body is still there, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's more fundamental. And so changes in the physical body, yes, they can affect the energy body, but the um, primar primary direction of influence is the other way. Changes in the energy body can can radically affect the physical body, and the energy body is not some ab abstract esoteric psychic thing. It is the mental emotional body. It's the the sum total of the psyche as it as it underlies the entire physical body, right? Mm -hmm. So the fact is, um, and I do actually want to invite women in the community who have. Um, undergone this procedure to, to, to get in touch with you, but I want you to know that their experience is not necessarily predictive of your experience because a strong energy body is going to react very differently to this procedure than, than a weaker energy body. And so I'll give you an example. If you're very deeply um, identified with the physical body, and not much in touch with other layers of the self, then the impact of such a procedure could be much greater. Mm -hmm. And of course, if a, if, if a woman had the um, belief that I'm supposed to have kids in this life and then has to have this happen, then and, and hasn't had kids yet, then that's gonna be devastating. And the reason it's devastating though is not because of the removal of the organs, it's because of the removal of the story to which they were very attached. So I'm just giving examples. Um, so this is a, is a great opportunity, you know? So if your identification is with deeper layers of the self more than with the physical body, it could even be the case that the procedure will not uh, have, the, have the huge impact that you imagine it might, you know? And in terms of, so in terms of the energy body itself, you, you may find that your access to the energetic centers in that region is unimpaired or is even stronger, right? Because again, uh, 
that that energy body since it's at a deeper level can be un can be can even flourish in the absence of some portion of the of the physical body right so um and again uh it's it's a great opportunity to maybe receive some some messages from others in the community um and and be open to those connections i would say without needing to believe that their experience is necessarily predictive for yours yeah and um one of our beloved community members erica just put in the chat window she works with women who no longer have wombs and um in in strengthening their energetic connection to that to those centers of the energy body so you might want to connect with erica um, so how, is that is that good for now? Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hmm. So I've got a bunch of messages over here as well. <laughs> Hard to keep up with all the messages when the 150 people on the call. Um, Zoe asks a question in the chat window that I don't quite understand. Maybe you wanna speak up out loud this question about recapitulation i'm not sure how how you're using that term that was a question from 25 minutes ago now hi hi can you hear me hello um yeah recapitulation it's like a kind of um sort of remembering closely past ev past events and doing breath work with it to kind of release and it's meant to be quite an intensive thing that you would do like um, to cover your kind of whole life to clear your energy field and reclaim any lost energy. Yeah, so that could be effective for somebody. But um, our default in this tradition is not to go digging through the past, which for some people can can reinforce their sense of limited identification meaning to say in this tradition we we teach um you are not your memories your personhood is not the summation of your memories your personhood is not the summation of of unresolved experiences stored in your body your personhood is not your trauma or or your or your trauma plus your memories and so on and yet um we don't want to bypass any of that. So the so the way that the tradition works with it is this ra maintaining this radical willingness or openness to um, seeing whatever needs to be seen and feeling whatever needs to be felt um, without sort of mining the psyche for 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 memories or reliving uh, traumatic experiences or 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 um you know and it may be that i just don't uh, properly understand what you're talking about but um but it's it is it's a little bit different from any other any form of psychotherapy as well and not that psychotherapy is bad psychotherapy can be absolutely great any of these therapeutic modalities can be great um but uh, a lot can be done with this sitting in open awareness um, after doing some inner work, right? Some practices to move energy or activate centers or, or get centered, or, you know, the work with the breath, et cetera, et cetera. You do these practices and then you sit in open awareness, really honestly affirming, I'm willing to see whatever needs to be seen. I'm willing to feel whatever needs to be felt. And then you hold that space open for some time for anything to arise. 
And in this tradition, we say um, Kundalini Shakti, which is the intelligent force or power that, that facilitates the awakening process, will show you whatever needs to be seen and will give you the opportunity to digest unresolved emotions from the past by simply presenting them to you at the right time. Whereas when we go digging in our psyche, we can actually expose ourselves to something we're not, we're not ready to digest and sort of re-traumatize ourselves, you know? So we trust, and, and you know, uh, people who work in other modalities could totally disagree with that, this, and I'm, I'm fine with that. But in this tradition, we trust that Kundalini Shakti will, will bring up that which needs to be digested and is ready to be digested. Um, so I know this, this, this could be an, and probably should be a longer conversation, but that's, that's my short answer for now. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Okay. Okay. Lots of interesting things in the chat window. Felipe says um, six minutes ago that he read about um, Paradevi's Mula Mantra uh, or, or Bija Mantra in a translation and another book. And just to, just so you know, we don't traditionally we don't say a mantra conversationally. Um, we just refer to it conversationally. We only say, speak it in practice contexts. So I'm saying Paradevi's Bija Mantra instead of speaking the mantra. But Felipe says, does one have to be initiated in this mantra by a guru? I read somewhere that Abhinava Gupta himself wrote that this mantra can be practiced without initiation. No, Abhinava Gupta did not write that. Um, there has to be some form of initiation, but it can be initiation by the goddesses of your own consciousness, which is something that he discusses at, at some length, and I don't have time to get into now but suffice to say this mantra and any mantra needs to come to you in a living form right traditionally that means you don't get it out of a book uh, a teacher shares it with you in a practice context the teacher does not need to be a guru uh you know well Every teacher is a guru, but a <laughs> teacher does not need to be a capital G t sort of uh, guru, you know, that um, it's officially designated as such and pedestalized by all and sundry and has a big beard and everything um, or whatever. <laughs> Flowing robes. No, um, but it does need to come to you through living through 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 a living tradition. Right now, that might even be. A YouTube video, well, probably not for this particular mantra that you're alluding to, but you can you can receive a mantra through a YouTube video if the person recording it is has a living relationship with that mantra, then it can arrive in your heart mind in a living state, right? In a chaitanya, a, a conscious, awakened, vibratory state. Um, but traditionally, you can't you can't get it out of a book in that in that in that way, you know. So whether it comes to you in a, in, ideally in a, in a live practice context or whether it comes to you through a recording, um, either way, it's, you're hearing it and it's entering you as sonic vibration. That's the requirement.
Yeah, and and going back just briefly to this issue of sort of processing old stuff or processing trauma, uh, what people call trauma these days, somebody private messaged me an important point, um, which is essentially that when you start tapping into unresolved experiences and old pain, because you are not an island, because you're not a separate being, but actually part of a collective consciousness, what can also happen to some people is that they actually start tapping into collective pain, shared, you know, uh, um, whether it's from uh, their genetic lineages or whether it's from past lives or whether it's from the collective unconscious, you know, and that c you can easily end up sort of biting off more than you can chew, right? There you are trying to process your, um, you know, let's say your, your trauma as a woman. And if you don't have the right guidance and you start tapping into the collective trauma held by all womankind, well, that's going to crush you pretty darn quick, you know. Um, and it's not your job, right, to, tr to, to, to try and process that and that's the, that's what can that's how people who feel they want to save the world in one way or another um that's how they can really get themselves into trouble right by by uh, unwittingly tapping into some of that collective stuff and then trying to process it on behalf of 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 everyone right so that's not the way in this tradition by by becoming free right? That does, a certain amount of healing is involved in this process, but ultimately it's about becoming free of identification with all the limited aspects of selfhood whilst, while not ignoring, denying, or bypassing them, you know? And then if you are liberated, if you're a liberated being, which is the goal of this tradition, uh, even if you're sort of only partway liberated, <laughs> you free all the other people in your life, all the other people you come into contact with from your fear, from your um, frustration, from your um, uh, bitterness, from your, your, you know, the list goes on and on. If you just become liberated enough to liberate yourself and the people in your life from the, the, um, unresolved experiences reinforced by identification, then you have already done a great, great service to the world and a very uncommon one, you know. Um, and so that's, that's I, I would argue, about as close as we can come to really, um, truly, you know, making a, a, an impact. That's a whole... That's a whole potential can of worms, but um, oh yeah, okay. So Hafizullah, um, our resident scholar practitioner of Sufism, um, he messaged me that in private message, but then I saw he shared it with everyone, right? He's saying, if you don't have an understanding that not everything you experience is created by you, you can become enmeshed in endless rounds of process and release that do not lead to freedom. Important point. You do not want to become enmeshed in endless rounds of process and release that don't lead anywhere. You know, so it's important to consider this. Okay, Victor, and other people can put up their hands too if they like. Hello. Hello. Okay. Uh, this is not very intellectual, it's rather intuitive. Uh, I had a very special dream uh, and I want an advice from you concerning that dream. The dream was very clear, you know, it's very bright, very, uh, I don't know, beautiful. 
And very shortly, I was descending in a cave and suddenly uh, I, I get into an open space in the front of, in front of a lake. Okay. I wanted to swim on, in, inside of that lake just to jump in, but I, I checked it and I realized that it's an acid lake. Then I, I saw a beautiful bridge over the lake and two dragon dogs. I mean, they were dogs and dragons and they were very white and uh, all the, the bridge was covered with snow. <laughs> And uh, the dogs, they were very, very nice with me and they lead me over the bridge. And over the bridge, there were two palaces. One was, a, was a black in the left side and one was white. And over them, it was a very beautiful winter sky with uh, bright stars. Now, I went toward the, the white uh, palace and suddenly, after I made maybe one or two steps toward the, the White Palace, uh, in front of the gate appeared a very fierce uh, woman deity, and she was bright red, hmm. you know. And I wasn't scared or something, uh, but I, I, I felt a very big emotion, so I wake, wake up. And then I realized, hey, it was actually Parapara Devi. Hmm. She was looking basically exactly like Parapara Devi. And, you know, uh, in, in the last years, I, I worked a lot with uh, uh, Paradevi's Bija Mantra, you know, of the story. And maybe you remember. So, can this be a sign that I should? Uh, work for a period with para para Devi instead of para Devi. can a goddess lead you to a, another goddess i mean can be a sign can i give this interpretation of the dream could be Now I just can't stop thinking about how I really want a white dragon dog. <laughs> yes, there were two and very beautiful. Yeah, very that beautiful. sounds like the coolest thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, white and red are traditionally colors of Shiva and Shakti, respectively. Um, and yeah, I, I did immediately think of Parapara Devi. Uh, um, but of course, you know, other deities like Lalita are also depicted as red. But you said she, she was a bit fierce. Yes. Yeah, like Parapara Devi. So it could be, you know, it could be. It could be that you start um, working with her mantra and you immediately feel, oh, this is right. This is, this is where I'm supposed to be, you know. Um, and each of the Trika goddesses do have a different vibe, you know. Because Para's mantra it tends to be very, very soothing and meditative and inward turning, right? And Para's mantra is fierce and sort of sword like, cut through the bullshit, you know? And Parapara's mantra is, is also have a, has a lot of strong energy, a lot of activating energy, you know? And maybe, um, maybe that's called for in your life. I think you'd have to start. Um, experimenting and uh see see how it feels you know mm -hmm. but anyway it's a beautiful dream i mean it's you know it's not always the case that a dream it's often not the case that a dream means something it's often the case yeah. that it's just a gift a, you know it can be a gift of the goddess yeah i feel it like so i i just wanted the confirmation yeah yeah thank you yeah that's all thank you thank you uh, Lauren says she saw one yesterday. A dragon, a white dragon dog. I like that the boundaries between the worlds have become fluid for you now, Lauren. 
I want a photo. <laughs> um, yeah, 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 yeah. Nora refers to the to the dog-like dragon and never-ending story called Falcor, who was who was white, I believe. That's a very archetypal story right there. It's an old 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 movie based on an old book. Um. Do you want to see the people? <laughs> Bindu. Hey, buddy. No, oh, he's, he's camera shy. He's camera shy. It's okay. He's a little Buddha sometimes. Um... <laughs> okay, let me go back a little bit. Lauren says, can you say more about process and release? Well, you know, the best example maybe is something that happens in relationships a lot, uh, especially, you know, so these days, um, a lot of people involved in romantic relationships are addicted to drama. And when I say addicted, I mean you can literally become addicted to a cocktail of chemicals <laughs> that that cycles through your brain. And so you, you, you un unconsciously create relationship drama in order to build up tension and then have a resolution or release, right? when you process the tension together and then manage to have some sort of breakthrough um, and tears and, 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 you know, hugs or whatever. And that it seems like so great. Oh yeah, we're doing, we're having such a great relationship here. We keep having breakthroughs and maybe it is, or pay attention because maybe you're addicted to a cocktail of brain chemicals, in which case you will always keep finding another drama to create. You know, you keep finding another issue to have in the relationship so that you can generate more tension and then process it and release it and have a breakthrough again. And it's, you start to realize in certain relationships, it could be friendships too, not just romantic relationships, that there's almost like, it's a cycle that's just moving around in the horizontal plane, you know. Um, and you, there's a certain degree of development of shared intimacy just through shared experience of traumatizing each other, you know, and then, and then apologizing, right? So there is some, some real shared intimacy of having that history, but that's not the same as, as actually, you know, taking the, the, the whole mode of relating to deeper and deeper levels levels of um of truly truly seeing and, and accepting each other and becoming more and more free from drama and less and less uh, a, a addicted to some of those um brain chemicals you know so that's just one example um and people can get into that in the world of self-help self-healing too right they can get have some big release through so some breath work process or or um, whatever it is, and it can be so, you can get so high off that, some people, that, um, you know, it's like you've got to, you've got to keep finding traumas to release through whatever process you've discovered so that you can get high again, you know, um, so that's not, that's not spiritual development. Um, yeah. And and maybe you know maybe you know folks who, as Hafiz Allah says, um, you know, all of us have at least one family member, right, who just doesn't feel alive or even quite real unless they're upset about something, <laughs> and engaging you with their upset, right? Uh, so then it you know. You want to be the compassionate one. You want to show up for them. You want to hold space for them. But also, you got to realize with some people, maybe that's not the compassionate thing to do, 
right? Because it's it's not it's not part of a process of growth. It's part of a, of a, of an sort of endlessly repeating process that if you hold space for that you're kind of enabling possibly. Um, Someone named Faye says, Meow to Kuhn and Shorsh from a good friend. <laughs> she didn't say hello, she said meow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, come to Daniel in a moment. And Zoe follows up on her earlier comment about recapitulation, um, referring us to the Carlos Castaneda books, um, which have some interesting material in them for sure. I was into them at one point, you know. There's a lot of academic debate about whether the figure of Don Juan was in fact entirely fabricated by Carlos Castaneda, which leads us to a whole interesting, more interesting debate on fruits, not roots, meaning to say if what Carlos Castaneda wrote is truly helpful for an, an examined life or truly life enhancing, then it shouldn't matter whether he made up Don Juan or not. Um, except it does matter to some people because they want to know if the <laughs> alleged wisdom they're reading comes from an indigenous shamanic source or not. But anyway, she mentions this concept of sort of working through your whole life. And I do think there can be value to that, and especially like, you know, in AA, there's the process of making amends, which I, which I know can be totally transformative healing and releasing for so many people making amends where you go through and remember all those you've consciously or unconsciously harmed and you make amends either to them in real life writing them a letter or in your own heart you know um you know i'm sorry i love you please forgive me and 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 but in a more in a more detailed way that can be really powerful for some people and so the key that i want to stress here in light of this tradition is anything that helps you let go of of earlier versions of yourself is beneficial um but anything any process of mining through or sifting through your past that kind of um, deepens your identification with your story about yourself would be contraindicated, would be not helpful, according to this tradition. Um, Daniel, are you in Portugal now? Nope, I don't know not in Grimaldo. <laughs> okay, because I thought I saw a photo of you somewhere in Portugal. Yeah, I, I, just, I just came to Sweden now today, so. Oh, okay. I was, I was okay. in Portugal this this week before, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> right, what, so what I have... Like to share or ask? Yeah, I have I had two questions. Um, I, I'm going to post them in the chat because it's easier for me. Um, I, I might begin with the first one, which is about theory of reflection. If you have something to say about that, it would be interesting. Maybe not very very detailed, maybe, but you know, if you have something to say about that, it would be interesting to hear. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me repaste your your comment here, so everyone can see it. 
Yeah. So it's so interesting because I actually just referenced the Pratibhimba Vada today in our meditation, just by coincidence. So Pratibhimba Vada is Abhinavagupta's um, theory of reflection or his his way of explaining the nature of reality in which he says um, all that is perceived and all that is perceptible uh, the whole world, in other words, the whole universe, is in fact a reflection in the sky of consciousness. And there's a number of ways to work with this teaching and interpret it, and he talks about it at great length in Tantra Loka chapter 3 and Tantra Sada chapter 3. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the simplest ways to work with this teaching, as I suggested earlier to those people here on site, is to look at everything that appears in the world of your experience moment to moment and right. have the awareness that you're looking into a mirror the same way that you look into a literal physical mirror and see the physical body you identify with and you go oh that's me in fact you don't go oh that's me you don't even need to have a thought about it because the identification is instant and abhinavagupta talks about the possibility of having the same experience with everything, that everything you see and experience is uh, mirroring an aspect of your own vast nature back to you. Okay, so that's um, yes. that's that's, I, that's yeah. Go ahead. Because of yes, but the thing I'm thinking about is because um, like you say, what you say, what you see, and what you experience. And maybe it's interesting to talk about what specifically one can experience and not only because I think, for example, there is, there is, they talk about five different things, right? So it's like touch, uh, smell, mm -hmm. uh, and so on, um, uh, taste, sound, and form, right? Mm hmm. And, and so my, because the interesting thing is like, this is a metaphor they're using, right? And because, yeah, so I want, do you have anything to say about this? Like, yes, make it um, more, more clear. <laughs> well, this, because, I because, have a blog post on it because yeah. Vinavagupta does indeed talk about reflection in all five senses. And this is an important point is he doesn't want you to just understand reflection in the superficial way of visual, you know, Only, visual. Yeah. So he talks about reflection uh, in, in, in all five senses. Yes. Um, and he gives the example, you know, well, an example that probably none of us have had, but in <laughs> in the pre-modern medieval world, everyone had had seen has has seen somebody stabbed in the guts with a spear. So he mentions in a matter of fact sort of way, you know, you know, like when you see someone stabbed in the guts with a spear, you go, oh, there's a reflection in your own body, even if you've never been stabbed in the guts with a spear, something in you, goes, oh, you know. And he talks about that and he talks about um, other forms of reflection, um, such as, you know, the sensation in your sexual organs when you vividly remember uh, a, a profound or powerful sexual experience. So that's a kind of reflection, you know. So he's talking about all these forms of reflection and he and he gives us this incredible verse. And we're going to go over this in the Tantra Sada online retreat. Uh -huh in a okay. month we're going to spend a whole day on this okay um but here's the verse here's the verse for everyone you've probably read it uh, daniel but the verse for everyone is so beautiful to encounter the great master abhinavagupta wrote in my translation the entire world shines here within the self just as a complex creation appears in a single mirror however Awareness articulates and touches the universe of its experience in accordance with the flavor of its own self-awareness. No mirror can do that. Right? So what he's trying to st stress here is that this is not, you're not being confronted from without by this reflection ordained by some, you know, God in, uh, up in heaven or whatever. 
but that the entire universe of your own experience is, whether you know it or not, um, an articulation of uh, an expression, you might say, of what you are. Um, and the more and more that that's recognized through the power of reflective self-awareness, the more the the world of experience seems to reorganize itself into um, a mode of, of greater and greater harmony. So this is something we'll, again, go deeper into okay. Okay. in that mm -hmm. online retreat. All right. Um, I had another question, mm -hmm. uh, but you don't have to go. Maybe you can ignore it if you want to. It's fine. Hmm. So uh, I'm going to ask it anyway. So. So this is like, because you're a Sanskritist, so I thought maybe it would be interesting. Mm, yeah. So also, so this is, first of all, um, maybe Florentine can put the link to the Tantrasada chapter three blog posts that address this in some detail. Mm. But there, this is the great mystery, you know, that um, Abhinava Gupta unveils this radical at the time radical teaching in his in his um tantra loka 3 summarized in tantra sada 3 mm. whereby and he has to do some some clever gymnastics because in the tradition you're not supposed to um be original meaning to say <laughs> the 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 charge of originality is as serious then as the charge of plagiarism is now you see, because it's a scriptural tradition. And so therefore, you're always expanding on supposedly expanding on what earlier masters did, uh, even if you are a Binavagupta who is to us <laughs> one of the great earlier masters, right? So to come up with something, something brilliantly original, you have to actually disguise that it is brilliantly original and suggest that it's, that it's already implicitly present in some earlier scripture which is exactly what he does but what he does here is he weaves together this teaching on the matrika chakra the or the or, or matrika shakti right mm. the 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 all the powers and potencies of consciousness embodied in and symbolized by the phonemes of the sanskrit alphabet as a way of of <laughs> of teaching this pratibhimbavada that 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 the that the whole world is a reflection of what you are now this made more sense in the original tantric context than than makes sense to people today because in original classical tantra you will have already learned how to install and activate all the letters of the sanskrit alphabet in your body and then he gives this teaching that all those letters, all those phonemes actually um, uh, express different potencies and powers and capacities of consciousness as well as tattvas in the tattva system. And, and, he, and he breaks this down so brilliantly that you realize, my gosh, all the, the pulsations that make up the, 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 the phonemes of the Sanskrit language are instantiated as all the all the principles of reality in my everyday moment to moment experience so then if the teaching works you have this amazing kind of realization what's everything that's inside is outside everything that's outside is inside the microcosm of these 50 forms of pulsation in my energy body is expressed as the whole universe of my experience in in endlessly different combinations so if that sounds esoteric it is, but it's really interesting <laughs> too for the for those who want to read more about that. And this again will go into in depth in the uh, day three of the Tantrasada retreat in a month. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah. Good to see you. Um. So like many of us, Bindu the cat, Bindu, he has a spiritual name and then he has an everyday name like many of us, you know. Um, Bindu's his spiritual name, 
but uh, he only gets to be called that when he's acting like a little bodhisattva. Mm -hmm. Other times he's bandito. <laughs> um, okay. So we're we're getting getting ready to wrap it up. Oh, I'd like to um, introduce you to somebody. Uh, many of you know that that my mom is often on the call. Um, she's she attends most calls actually. Uh, I wouldn't say she's my biggest fan, but she's she <laughs> she's a loyal supporter. But um, almost almost never on the call is uh, Mr. Peter Wallace, who took me to meet an Indian guru for the first time when I was seven years old in whenever that was, 1979 or 80, 1980. And so uh, introducing Peter Wallace. Hey, Pop. Yeah. Chris, greetings. Nice to see Thank you. Me. I was on earlier and got I to heard talk that. about some of your secrets. Uh -huh. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, Peter is, uh, is in his 70s and is still an avid downhill skier, which I think is uh, impressive for sure. We're going to be 80 in two weeks. Oh, my goodness. 80. <laughs> still yeah. and still and still hitting the slopes yeah yeah <laughs> great to see you dad good to see you thanks yeah. I'm enjoying this all right see you soon all righty right yeah um yeah. So my my parents were were just weird enough to be a good influence, <laughs> right? You want them to be a little weird, not too weird. Um, yeah, and it's that great experience to. It's part of the spiritual path. Some of you have heard me talk about. It. It's part of the spiritual path to transition from seeing your parents as parents to seeing your parents as humans and possibly friends and i've been lucky to go through that translation transition and have uh uh two dear friends um who you know it's actually easier to regard your parents as manifestations of the divine just like everyone else when you stop seeing them as your parents mm -hmm. and the moment when you stop seeing your parents as parents is the moment you stop seeing yourself as a child whether you realize that consciously or not you know. Yeah. Yeah, so supposedly uh, earlier he told the story of how, quote, I used to drag my feet and be late all the time. <clears throat> yes, but I just want to highlight here that um, <laughs> this was at least in part due to, to, um, a kind of introversive fascination with, uh, with, I don't know, just the, the qualia of experience, you know, um, I, I was, I was, I was, I would literally drag my feet. I was fascinated by the, by, by, you know, the concrete and the, by the, the cracks in it and the grass in it. And, and anyway, <laughs> Nora says, yeah, we were truly shocked by this revelation. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and so, you know, when I first met an Indian guru when I was, when I was seven or eight years old um, with my dad, what I remember most actually is... Um, is, is listening to these beautiful devotional songs called bhajans in Hindi language, as well as uh, devotional songs called abhangas in Marathi language. And they were just captivating to me. And I wanted to know what they said, even though I didn't want to know 
I didn't care. Like the 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 guru was speaking in Hindi uh, the whole time. Didn't care to know what he said except when he sang mm. those traditional devotional songs. And then I was uh, something stirred something in me. You you could say maybe because of past life sonskaras. Who knows? But it is for sure hard to explain how an American kid exposed to no nothing Indian up to that point would be captivated by hearing those those devotional abhangas uh, and bhajans all the way down to the to the present day, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all. Okay, so people uh, are saying they need to go soon. So maybe we can um, just just end with a little practice of some kind. Yeah. <laughs> Um, maybe a practice and a song. <clears throat> okay. So the practice, which it came up organically here, uh, the practice I want to invite you to take with you for the next week or so is this one given by Abhinavagupta, which is to open to the possibility of seeing and perceiving that all you experience is a reflection of what you are that you are not just this singular body-mind with its particular memories and particular issues, that you are the whole of your experience. What would it be like to actually know in your bones, in your body, that you are the whole of your experience? Meaning to say, while well, you experience the sky and the clouds. You are that, and that's how you are. What would it be like to actually know that? Not think it, but know it. So in the Upanishads it says, Tattvamasi, usually translated as you are that. But the great scholar Patrick Olivelle argues the correct translation should actually be, that's how you are. Whatever you look at, whatever you experience, that's also how you are, right? So all the beauty and all the horror, the full range, the full range of consciousness experiences expresses the totality of your vast being. And of course, what you are is immeasurably more than the field of um, manifest experience, manifest perception, because you are also the uh, absolute potentiality which gives rise to universes of experience beyond this one, right? But don't worry about that for now, <laughs> because that's just a theoretical abstract thing until you experience it directly. The thing to notice now, the thing to be aware of now, is that when you look in a physical, in a literal mirror, and you see the reflection of this, to consider there's no reason to identify with just that, just that outline. No reason at all, it's just conditioning. When you look in the mirror, why don't you identify with everything you see? 
your total environment. When you don't look in the mirror, why don't you identify with everything you see, your total environment? Because you are all of it, literally. Literally, metaphysically, physically, spiritually, biologically, on every, in every possible way. You are your, the totality of your experience and the totality of your environment. Mm -hmm. So break yourself out of this limited identification. And the logical objection to this, of course, is people say, oh, but, but it's not, it makes sense to be identified with this body-mind and nothing else because I have control over this and not over anything else. To which we say, oh, do you? <laughs> <laughs> you don't even know the names of all your organs and where, where they are. <laughs> You don't, you don't know what the pancreas, well, some of you do, but do you know how to tell, do you have, do you tell it what to do every day? Do you instru give, issue instructions to your liver and your gallbladder? No. And you don't know how to make a thought either. You think you're the thinker of the thoughts, but that's just another thought. The fact is you don't know how to make a thought. They just arise spontaneously out of nowhere. It's a total illusion to think you're in control of this or anything else. So once you realize that, there's no more barrier to the realization that you are the totality of your experience. You're not just this. You couldn't be. So that's the teaching. This, uh, as Vinava Gupta says, this entire conditioned reality is simply a reflection in the space of awareness. Right? That's the simpler version of the teaching. This entire conditioned reality is simply a reflection in the vast space of awareness that you are. You are the whole of your experience and you contain the whole of your experience. What would it be like to become the whole of your experience? Explore that, play with that. Experiment. Everywhere you look, it's nothing but a mirror. There's nothing else to see anywhere in the universe. Everything reflects what you are. Everything. So here's one of those songs I heard as a kid. When introduced to Indian or South Asian spiritual culture um, that would dominate the rest of my life. Jyota se Jyota Jagavu Sadguru Jyota se Jyota Jagavu Merantara Timmira Mitavu Sadguru Jyota se Jyota
And one of the verses says, Antara me yuga yuga se so chitti shakti ko jagao. For ages within us that power has been slumbering. Awaken that power of consciousness within us, that chitti shakti. And it's a prayer. May my heart's flame be kindled and may its light banish darkness forever. Om. So I'll turn off Spotlight and you can go to Gallery View and see everyone and send blessing energy to all these beautiful beings, this incredible Kula, this beautiful spiritual community. I wish I could call you all out by name because you're all so beautiful, but there's like a hundred of you. So wonderful to see you all. So please send love and blessings to everyone, human and animal. <laughs> and we'll just sing a few rounds of Jai Jai Shiva Shambho while sending that blessing energy to everyone on your screen in gallery view. Just, just love them up and don't forget they're loving you up. Remember to receive, right, yogis? You gotta work on that sometimes. <laughs> receive it. Jaya Jaya Shiva Shambho Jaya Jaya Shiva Shambho Jaya Jaya Shiva Shambho Jaya Jaya Shiva Shambho Mahadeva Shambho Mahadeva Shambho Mahadeva Shambho Mahadeva Shambho Jaya Jaya Shiva Shambho Jaya Jaya Shiva Shambho Jaya Jaya Shiva Shambho Jaya Jaya Shiva Shambho Mahadeva Shambho Mahadeva Shambho Mahadeva Shambho Mahadeva Shambho Jaya Jaya Shiva 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 Shambho Mahadeva Shambho Mahadeva Shambho Mahadeva Shambho Mahadeva Shambho
Blessings of gratitude and love to all the saints, sages, siddhas, gurus, wisdom masters, peers, shaikhs, <laughs> all the great ones who have walked the path before us and whose blessings flow to us in the form of their teachings and practices. May we fully imbibe those teachings and practices for the benefit of all beings. May we fully embody those teachings and practices for the benefit of all beings. May we taste the sweet fruit of the spiritual life in all its fullness, and may we offer that fruit to others. And may all beings be free. May all beings realize their freedom. May all beings know fullness. Om. Thank you so much for being with us. And see you next time. Please remember to check out the new website tomorrow. Tomorrow, check it out tomorrow. Um, and give us feedback. Well, this is for you. This is for this community, for all of us. Sweet dreams, sweet waking. We love you. See you soon. And most importantly, keep the connection. <laughs> yeah.